Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus and thank you for joining us again another evening for our teaching on prophetic by design. Um, you know, it has been really a, a odd weekend for us here in Durban. It's been cold. We've even got snow in certain parts of, of Durban, which is uncharacteristic of, of the weather here. But we thank God that his hand is over us. Amen. But this is also signs. These are signs of, uh, uh, you know, the, of many things that are, that are coming and many things that are about to happen and take place. And so we just thank God for his grace uh, upon us and his protection and covering. And so tonight I, w I welcome you again. And we wanted to share, I want to share a few thoughts with you on the topic called First Things First. So if I could say it in, a, in another way, putting the first things first. Uh, I, I really believe that this is the challenge of the present day church. Uh, we have lost, uh, like the word of God says in, in Revelation 2, when God speaks to the church of Ephesus, he says you have left your first love. And so I wanted to speak a little bit on that tonight. Can we just pray together? Father, we ask just that you would speak to us, that you would reveal your hearts to us. And Father, I pray that you would rekindle the fire, rekindle the passion, restore, O oh God, the joy of our salvation. And for everyone that is trusting you for something fresh, something new, show up in their lives. Father, for those, O oh God, that have gotten distracted along the way, may you restore them. Restore them back to the place that you have initially called them to, a place, O oh God, where they operated in power, a place where they experienced your glory and your anointing over their life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, tonight, as I said, I want to just speak a little bit. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start our, our teaching over here. Uh, it's a teaching I've done some years ago, and I wanted to just reiterate it tonight, uh, just because, you know, one of the things that I've seen is that um, our generation and our generations before us, uh, uh, like our parents' generation or my parents' generation, uh, when they were in church, there was a real love and passion for the things of God. And even there was a great desire to see the Spirit of the Lord moving um, in the church, moving in the lives of people. It was a very, very overt um, and tangible presence of God in the gatherings, in the lives of people. People were mindful of uh, the, the move of the Spirit. People were, were mindful of the, the hand of God over them. They were mindful of the ways that God will manifest even in their lives. And even the, the, the pursuit for the gifts of the Spirit, the pursuit that God will, will, will through His Holy Spirit, manifest gifts amongst men. And it be evident in the church beyond just intelligent speaking and preaching, uh, powerful preaching, and just fresh revelation. There was really a demonstration of the power of God. And, and somehow I see it lacking. Somehow there is a concern in, in me that our children do not have the same passion to pursue the glory of God. You know, the, uh, you know Moses would say it like this. He said, Lord, show me your glory. Um, when last has it been that you said that? He said, Lord, show me your glory. I just want to see you, your manifest presence. When last did you position yourself to really say, God, you know what, I, I need you to show up. I need you to manifest your glory. When last have we taught our children to say, Lord, show us your glory? Because, you know, we've often, most of us have grown in homes, and if you've grown in the church, um, you would have grown in some time or the other where they would have what they called uh, uh, Holy Ghost services, and, you know, where they trust for the infilling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where there will be a releasing of giftings, uh, you know, services where there was continuous prophetic sounds and prophetic words that are being released and prophetic songs that are being sung. 
you know, and, and I pray that this will also become the experience of our children and their children. Because the reality is that we need to be able to transfer from one generation to another generation the encounters with God. That means as much as Abraham had an encounter with God, Isaac had to have his encounter with God. That will remind him of the word that God gave to Abraham. And in the same way, we read last week about Jacob. How Jacob would have an encounter with God. And the, the word that God gave to Abraham and to his father Isaac will be repeated in his life. And, and there is something about a multi-generational church, a multi-generational ministry, a multi-generational household that is fulfilling the purposes of God, experiencing the power of God that is great. Now, let, let, let me not digress too much, but let me just, just get into the word here and just emphasize a few thoughts for us. So Revelation chapter 2 verses 1, it says, To the angel of the church at, at Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks amongst the seven golden candlestands, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. So, so we understand that, uh, yeah, we, we understand the first description is of, of Jesus Christ, the one that is walking amongst the candlestands, walking, uh, walking with the stars in his right hand. And then it says, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. So, so there is a, the, the, the first way that God greets the church of Ephesus, he says, these are not just lazy, it's not a lazy church. It's a church that is really doing everything they can to please God, to serve God. He says, and I've seen your perseverance. He says, I, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and you have found them to be false. You have persevered, endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Wow, what a powerful introduction to this church. I mean, this is not no ordinary church. We can see there is a strong apostolic grace over this house because they were able to test those that came and claimed to be apostles, claimed to have an apostolic grace upon their lives and found them to be false. So we understand there is a, a spirit of discernment in this house there is a there is a spirit of knowing the things of god there's a there's a spirit of of, of pursuing truth that is in the house he says you have persevered you have endured hardships that means you've you've overcome some things there's been it hasn't been an easy journey but you've overcome some things and you've not grown weary that that is the most powerful thing that means when sometimes when we get into a, a spiritual battle or we're dealing with certain challenges in our lives, sometimes we get weary in it. But yeah, he says, you, you, you've gone, gone through some testing, but you did not get weary. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your love that you had first. This is the NIV that I'm reading from. It says, you have forsaken. The King James says, you have left your first love. And then he goes on and he says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did first. If you do not repent, I will remove you and remove your lampstand from its place. But if you you have this, but you have this in your favor that you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. To the one who is victorious, or to the one that overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. Now, what a powerful, but we, we see such a twist. You know, uh, there's a powerful introduction to this church, but he says, well, whilst you're doing a lot of good things, there is something that you've lacked. There is something that you have left. Now, there's something, you know, I've, oft, I've grown up in church for a long time and we've ministered. And I, and I think for years I was ministering this and never reading the context, but quoting as I heard it being said before that, uh, uh, that you have lost your first love. 
But the scripture doesn't say lost. Because losing something means that there is somehow uh, something that occurred that is beyond your control, that you have lost something. Right? But here he says you have left or you have forsaken your first love. That means there was a conscious awareness that you came to, a decision that you made, and you left the thing that you were doing first. And this is what he says, you have the love that you had first. He, and then he goes on in verse 5 and he says, consider how far you have fallen. That means he is he, almost equating this. He's saying your first love puts you at, a, at, at this standard and you are now operating at, on, on a level that is below this the standard that you were originally set. And he's saying you've fallen from it. Now I want you to get back to it. And, and the way you get back to it is you repent. And, and, and he says, and if you do not repent, look at, at, the, at the harshness of the statement. The harshness of the statement, he says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. So, so he was saying that amongst the purposes of God, remember, this is uh, the, the message is, uh, if you go in chapter 1 of Revelation, the, the, the Spirit of the Lord is moving amongst the, uh, the lampstands, and each lampstand is symbolic of the different churches. And the angel of the Lord coming to them is the messenger that is bringing a particular message to them. And if you go and do an entire study of Revelation, and we, we could do that in, in coming weeks, but one of the things that we see was there was a particular message to each of them. And it wasn't not just a message to the church of Ephesus, it's a message to us. Because remember, much of Revelations was not only written for, the, for that context, but it was written for us as the New Testament church. And in this, it was saying, you have left your first love. And he says, consider. So the Lord is leaving it up to us to go back to look at it. And he's saying, consider how far you've fallen and repent. It's up to you to repent. It's up to you. Now, I, I do not know about you personally, how far you have been in, in your walk with the Lord, how far you have gone through some challenges in your life or in your walk with the Lord. But I know that if you've been in the faith for a long time, there is a great possibility that many people have moved away from the things that they did first. That love, that passion, that drive, that desire to be in the house of the Lord, to be in the presence of the Lord, to serve God, that passion that you had for God. Now, now it's really come to the place of convenience. It's come to the place of trying to reason it. It's trying to just, sometimes you tend to justify your actions. Some of you were gifted and when you came into salvation and you came into the ministry and you came to receiving God and you may have, you may have even grown up in the church and and there came a season where you were really passionate about the things of God. But today you don't have that same passion. And I'm saying to you, consider your ways. Consider, repent. The Lord is ready to restore you back to that place. And the challenge was, and it's actually not just a challenge, it's a caution and a warning. He says, if you would not return to your, uh, to, to, to your first love, he says, I will remove your lampstand. It was almost as if God was saying, I'm going to remove this church. I'm going to remove Ephesus. And everything good that we just heard him um, you know, praise them for, he says, it does not matter. It does not matter in comparison. In comparison to you losing your first love. And now this is a very, very important essence. When I asked the question, I said, but what is the first love of the church of Ephesus? Because it's very important to ask, because if you don't know what was the thing that drove you, the thing, the passion that you had, you know, for, for many ministers that have been in ministry for a long time, sometimes after a while, that, that passion that you initially had, sometimes... Uh, you know, it, it was youthful. Sometimes it was, it, you never was worried about everything else. And 
over the years you've now become concerned about the different aspects of ministry and the different projects and the different programs and and everything but when you first came into serving God you had a passion you may be a musician you may be a worship leader you may be a singer a musician you may be a leader within the church and you you serve God and you said okay you know maybe now I don't really have it and you know you're older and you're thinking you know maybe I should just hand it over but I want you to understand the word of the Lord to you today is return to your first love is there things in your ministry in your gifting in the in the call of God for your life that you have not fulfilled as yet and if it is you got to get deep you have to reach deep down get back to that place where God and renew that passion and that desire and that fire for God so that you can begin to move forward now when I looked at the church of Ephesus I, I asked the question what did they do first now let's go go with me to the book of Acts chapter 19 and I'm gonna uh, maybe share a few thoughts that may give you some insight verses 1 it says while Apollos was at Corinth and Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus there he found some disciples and he asked them did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed and they answered and they said no we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit so Paul asked then what baptism did you receive they said John's baptism they replied Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one that was coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak in other tongues and prophesy. And there were about 12 men in all. Now, powerful, right? But you know what's the amazing thing about this portion of scripture? It's Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 2, there was already the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at, 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 on the, in the upper room. Many people were gathered. Almost 3,000 people get saved after Peter goes and he, he challenges people in the marketplace. There's been other accounts up until this point where there were outpourings of the Holy Spirit. This is a church that is functioning but under the teachings of John the Baptist, but they've never experienced a move of the Holy Spirit. So Paul coming to them challenges them and says, you've been baptized, yes, but in, 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 into the baptism of John, which was water baptism. But he says, John told you there's one that is coming up to me that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. And, and this was not the reality that this church was functioning on. And so the, the Bible says that even as, as Paul laid his hands on them, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. And when the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, they began to prophesy and speak in tongues. That means the, the, the first element that we see about this church in the church of Ephesus is they operated in the power of the Holy Spirit that means there was a strong move of the prophetic that means they prophesied there was a move of the Spirit they spoke in other tongues but then it goes on it says and Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God and but some of them became obstinate and they refused to believe and, and, and publicly malaligned mel the way. So Paul left them and he took the disciples with him and they had discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannius or the school of Tyrannius and he went on there for two years. So this is almost two years, three months. I, I mean, you're looking at almost like 20, 25 months. He's teaching on a daily basis. People are, 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 are listening to him and this, he says, this went on for two years. And so that all the, 
all the Jews that lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and even evil spirits left them. Amen. Now, there was a demonstration of also the power and the miraculous hand of God. So when we look at the, the church of Ephesus and the Lord says to them, return to your first love. He's saying, get back to the word. Get back to the spirit. Get back to the place where there is the power, where there's power, there's signs, wonders, and miracles taking place. How did this take place? Paul was only teaching the word. He wasn't having an evangelistic crusade. He was not having a special healing service. Paul was just merely teaching the word and the grace and the anointing of God upon him was so great that the people, they, they, the, the Bible says handkerchiefs that, and aprons and piece, uh, pieces of cloth that was touched on his body, they took it and they laid it on the, on the bodies of sick people and they were healed uh, on people that were demon possessed and they were delivered. The, I mean, miracles were taking place, supernatural miracles. This was, I want you to understand this. When God said to, to, to the church of, uh, in, in the book of Revelation of Ephesus, get back to your first love, he's saying, I want you to get back to that place. Where it's not just about a, a, a theological understanding of me and not just a place of, 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 of just defending doctrine, but to the place where there is also the power and the demonstration of the power of God, where there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where people are released into the gifts of speaking in tongues and released into the gifts of the Spirit. I want you to understand this is not a season where one thing is only correct and the other thing is incorrect. This is the both end. That means we need to understand when God was saying to the church of Ephesus, return to your first love, he's saying return to that place where when, when you preach the word, miracles took place. We didn't ever emphasize one thing over the other. It wasn't the word or, or, or the miraculous. It was the word and the miraculous. The Bible says, and Jesus preached the word, and there were signs, wonders, and miracles that followed the teaching and the preaching of the word. So if we believe in the word, and if we believe as apostolic houses, I believe as apostolic houses, there should be a strong preaching of the word, but the preaching of the word should bring the manifestation of power. That means healing should take place. Deliverance should take place. Anointing should be released. Impartation should take place. That means there should be a demonstration of the power of God. Our, our children that are sitting, our youth and our young children that are sitting in the church should experience the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They should feel the passion of God. They should feel the light and the light of God just shining on their lives. They should experience God for themselves. And in that place, it will not just become an experience that died with our generation, but it will be the God that was, that who was and who is and who is to come, that he is able to do this even in this generation, and he can release an, a power and an anointing, because our children need to be anointed for what they are facing right now. Our, our young people need to be anointed for what they are facing right now. The world as they know it is changing right before their eyes. And they need to have an endowment of power. They need to have an experience with the Almighty God. They need to begin to experience Him in such a powerful way. In the name of Jesus, Shakamando, in the name of Jesus, that our children will begin to have, be on fire for God. That we believe that there will be an impartation of the Spirit of God. Some of you have not been in church and, and some of you are in your homes, but believe God that your children will be fast, pray. Teach them how to wait upon God. Teach them how to pursue God. Teach them how to trust God. Teach them. You see, the, 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 the challenge here was, he says, return to your first love. To the 21st century church. To the post-pandemic church. It's going to have to be a church that is moving in the power of God. Must be a church that is built on the word of God. 
must be a church where we are tenacious and that we are that that we are discerning. Not only are we just built up on the word itself, but we need to be able to have the gifts of discernment, like the church of Ephesus. They were able to discern the false, the, the those that were, were false prophets and those that were false uh, false apostles. The Bible says uh, 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 he loved this about them because they hated this, the, the Nicolaitans. You know, the spirit, of the, the challenge of the Nicolaitans where they were a people of mixture. They mixed truth and the word of God with culture and with, uh, and with secular thought. And when God says, uh, you hate the spirit of the Nicolaitans, this was a church that hated mixture. In, 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 in the world that we are living in that is humanistic, where, where secular thinking and reason and logic ha, ha, has challenged even the very essence of, of church and ministry, where many of our children uh, are in church out of obligation because they grew up in church, but they, they have a sense of reason and no reality and no encounter with God that can pull them through the season. And once they get into university and once they get into their own careers and their own jobs, they are leaving church because they say it didn't mean anything to me. It meant something to my dad. It meant something to my mom because you, were, you had an encounter with God that brought you to that place. But they didn't have that encounter. They cannot live their life, their spiritual life through you vicariously. They're going to have to have an encounter with God. You've got to trust God that God will shake them, that God will wake them up in a midnight hour. God will intervene in the midst of their lives, in the midst of their career decisions, in the midst of their, their pursuit of knowledge, that they would not be caught up in a culture of, le uh, uh, of legalism or even humanism and secular humanism where they would will lose their identity and their spiritual identity and God will bring them back. Many a children we have lost along the way to circular thinking because we justify success and prosperity over an, a God encounter. We have traded and the Bible says and I will remove your lampstand. May the Lord protect us. May the Lord not remove our lampstand. May the Lord not remove every sense of our faith. But the Bible says but to them that overcome I will give them to eat of the tree of life that is in the midst of paradise. I'm here to say to you, the, the, the tree of life which God assigned the cherubims to stand guard over so that Adam in his fallen state will not eat of it. He says, but when you come into that place where you overcome this spirit, this spirit, this spirit that is holding you back from returning to your first love, he says, when you overcome this, I will give to you to eat of the tree of life because God knows he can trust you there will be a purity that will be produced in you. So I'm saying to you, put the first things first. Return back to that place. Some of you may be sitting here and, and some of you may be listening and may, may be saying, but my faith has grown tired, I've grown tired. But God is saying to you, return back to your first love. Do the things that you did first. You can't do this on your own. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to be exposed to fresh word, fresh manner. Because as Paul began to speak, what started out with 12, began the whole city began to know the truth. It noised abroad. I want you to understand, you don't have to go to multiple locations. What you are doing in one location can reach many. Today, technology allows me to be in your home and in the homes of many other people. It's not a tool that we should take for granted. Many people have access to truth. The reality is, are you prepared to engage with it? I pray today, may there be an impartation of the Spirit of God. May God begin to disencounter you in your dreams, in your home, give you visions. May you have a God encounter while you're at your workplace or even in your office, wherever you are. Maybe as you're cleaning your home, May you have an encounter with God. May God speak to you.
May that spirit of dryness be removed in Jesus' name. God has got, a, got something great for you. All he's asking you to do is return back to your first love. Your first love for him. Amen. You may say it's impossible, Pastor. Too many years. Seems like it's water under the bridge. We can have many colloquial and, and too, too many terms. But today, God is saying it, the, the instruction to the church of Ephesus was a return to your first love. That means he says it's possible. I'm here to tell you today it's possible to return to that place where you can serve him, love him unconditionally. To that place where the spirit of God just livens you up again. And he said a, a, a smoking uh, you know, uh, flax. You know, uh, uh, you know, if you look at a candle and it's just smoldering, it's not in flame, it's just smoldering, God says, I can set it alight again. That's what God wants to do in your life. He's just going to set you alight again. It's not going to quench it. It's going to set you alight again. Amen. Let's just bow our heads together. Father, we love you, we adore you, we glorify you. I pray, O oh God, for those that are listening, that are under the sound of my voice tonight. I pray, O oh God, may you encounter them. Father, may there just be a, 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 a renewed passion and a renewed de desire for the things of God. May you, O oh God, begin to move in their lives in a new way, in a fresh way. Father, we pray today, watch over them, keep them, guide them, protect them. But more than anything else, O oh God, let the light of God shine through them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Well, I pray that you take up that challenge. You trust God, believe God. He's going to do it in your life. Amen. And so we look forward to seeing you next week at the same time. Amen. And we, there is a fresh a set of teachings we're going to be doing on spiritual warfare. Join us. I know you're going to be blessed. God bless.